When it comes to TT120, Pico make this track and Hornby make this track. But which one should you choose? Let's find out. This is the Pico, one length of Pico flexi track then, uh, which is one yard, so 91.5 centimeters, I believe. And cheapest I could find this was on Hatton's for four pounds 20. This is the Hornby set track straight, and uh, it's two pound 49, but that's one piece so each one of those is two pound 49 so you need we've got sort of four there you'd need five sort of five and a half six to achieve the same uh, you know yard of track so that would be uh, almost 15 pounds to get the same length so i think on price we have a clear winner in the pico track at least on the straight pieces. So for curves, I'm actually going to compare Hornby, uh, the, the track that they give you in the train set, which is Radius 3 set track. Uh, with two of these uh, Pico Flexi tracks, you could do a 180 turn. Uh, so that would obviously be £8.40. But I would highly, highly advise uh, getting some track templates. I don't think the official track setter ones that I normally use are, are out in TT120, but I did find some on eBay for £17. So you can sort of, it helps you to set the radius of the curve and hold it there while the pins are being put in or the glue is drying on the track. But obviously you only have to spend that £17 once. So you have to factor that in. With Hornby, you obviously don't have to bend the curves yourself. So that's a bit more convenient. You get, uh, this is the radius three, and six of these will get you around 180 degrees, and they are two pounds 99 each. So that would be precisely 17 pounds 94 uh, to get around the corner. So again, that's kind of covered the cost of the uh, track templates for the flexi track. So again, it looks like the uh, Pico track is winning on price but what about the detail let's take a closer look Hornby track here Pico track here new toy here <laughs> bought uh, a set of digital calipers which go down to 0 0.01 of a millimeter if you're going to do this might as well do it properly so yeah bought this to sort of measure the sleepers and sleeper spacing and so on first of all though Let's have a good look at the track itself. Uh, the Hornby track, uh, you can see, looks quite fine. Uh, got a bit of a pattern on the wooden sleepers. The fasteners look quite chunky to me. And you can see there the sort of rail height we've got sticking up. Uh, as I say, we'll measure it all later. What we've also got, and if we can get it to pick it up, is we've got holes for pins. Every sort of six or seven uh, sleepers, we've got a hole in the rail, which I don't necessarily want. And we've also got these strange sleepers here, which uh, this is not a this is one solid piece of track, it's not joined, but the webbing underneath has this odd set of sleepers in the middle, which uh, kind of spoils the look of it a little bit for me. The Pico track, I'd say the sleepers do look uh, significantly chunkier. We've got some wood grain effect, I think it looks a bit better. Uh, we've got no holes and we've got no weird uh, bits on the edges of the sleepers. So I think uh, I think the Pico track does look better. Uh, quite a chunky height of the sleepers there. They, they look quite tall. 
but you can see the rail height does look a lot less. Although they both actually use code 55 rail. Let's see if I can get it to focus. So you might just be able to see there that some of the rail on the Pico track is actually buried in the sleeper. And this is just like the N gauge track that I use. And it means that although the rail is the same height as the Hornby track, which we'll see later, hopefully is good for compatibility. The look of it, it actually looks uh, more realistic in terms of the, the rail height isn't quite as tall as the Hornby track. So as I understand it, and this information was not as clear cut and easy to find as I was hoping, um, on a straight track, a typical sleeper spacing is 700 millimeters in real life on the real railway between the middle of one sleeper to the middle of the next. And a typical uh, real sleeper, if you were to measure that distance, would be 250 millimeters. And typically the height of the sleeper would be 125 millimeters. I'm sure there are variations to that. But uh, that's the information that I have. Please correct me in the comments if I'm wrong. So let's measure the Hornby track. So 250 mil translates to 2.08. And you can see the Hornby track is very close to the correct sleeper width. However, if we measure the height of the sleeper it's exactly the same in other words uh, the sleepers are square when they should be rectangular now actually i don't think that's a problem because uh, well it's not a problem if you're ballasting the track because you would put the track down and you would cover it in ballast and actually you wouldn't see that uh, they were square so i don't think that matters uh, so measuring the height of the metal rail on both comes out to the same measurement, uh, 2.2 millimeters. But obviously we've got more of it sticking up on the Hornby track compared to the Pico track. Now, sleeper spacing. So 700 mil should be, I believe, 5.8333 recurring in uh, TT120. So if we carefully try and measure that distance there between the sleepers. We get 7.24, but we've got to take off the width of one sleeper to uh, make that the center of there to the center of there. So that comes out as a sleeper spacing of 5.18 millimeters, which uh, from what I can tell is closer than it should be. So they're, they're sort of too close together, but they are nicely sized. When you put the two side by side, it is very clear that they are spaced quite differently. So let's measure the Pico track. So we've got slightly bigger sleepers, uh, 2.1819. And I'm guessing, because they certainly look they certainly look square yeah 2.2 maybe even a bit more but yeah essentially they are also square so they should be 2.08 so they're as i make it a tiny bit bigger than they should be however they do look as though they're spaced further apart so there you can see on the pico track we've got 8.06 mil uh, sleeper spacing so I make that around 5.8 something, 5.88 around that sort of area. And if it should be 5.83, that is very, very close. I think allowing, allowing for some sort of measurement error. Um, I think the sleeper spacing on these, on the Pico track is bang on. Now then, what about the points? The Pico point comes in this nice, uh, recyclable cardboard packaging, so points for that. And uh, looks rather smart too. 
So that's the uh, Pico point, and it is something I've not seen before. It is a unifrog. Here it is, so you'll be able to tell uh, which one's the Pico because it's got the wire already uh, soldered onto the frog, uh, which is great because it means I don't have to do it. And we've got the Hornby point. So you can see straight away the Pico point is slightly longer and it actually has a gentler curve. Um, I think this sort of radius is a sort of nominal 640 millimeters, whereas this is more like just over 900. So the Hornby, the Hornby ones are quite gentle uh, curves, but the Pico are even gentler. And yes, we need to mention the elephant in the room, <laughs> the big plastic uh, dead frog in the middle of the Hornby point. Doesn't look realistic. Uh, also not sure what's going on here. I don't think anyone would argue that the Hornby point looks more realistic. I think we have to give it to the Pico point on that one. But with these, uh, essentially as they come, um, they work, uh, this is called inchul frog. When you've got a plastic insulated frog, it's called inchul frog. This out of the box actually works like an inchul frog point. So this is actually dead until you connect this up to something. And that something can be uh, a point motor, like I've used on my other layout, the Cobalt Digital IP point motors. You just connect that to the frog terminal and it supplies the correct power to this bit of the track. So it's all live and then uh, the point motor deals with switching the polarity of this bit, depending on which way it's set. You can also use something called a frog juicer if you're not using point motors. We do have a clear winner, I think, on looks. However, there is another factor. Uh, I think the RRP of the Pico point is about 18 pounds. I got this for 15 pounds 50. Uh, this, I believe, is 7.99. So a lot cheaper uh, on the on the Hornby points. So nearly nearly sort of half the cost. So that could be a factor if you uh, are building a layout with a lot of points. Also, of course, depends on your situation. If you have just got a tabletop or you're just building a loop of track on the floor then uh, that you're gonna have to put away, then flexi track is not really gonna work for you because it's uh, it may not hold its shape in the curve that you want to, to sort of do. So in that case, really, you're going to go for the set track, aren't you? And uh, you can dismantle that and put it put it away. If you are pinning it down or gluing it down, then I think uh, my mind is made up anyway. Uh, I think I'm going to go for the, the Pico track. Obviously, it's entirely up to you. There are no wrong answers. But uh, yeah, I think that's what I'm heavily leaning towards at the moment. And to complete the test, we are going to check the compatibility. Pico track, Hornby point, and uh, this confused me for a little while. The rail joiners that you need for the TT120 track are actually the same as the end gauge ones. So I probably didn't need to buy those. I probably got a drawer full of them somewhere, but hey ho. So we've even got Hornby fish plate and a Pico fish plate. Let's see how we get on. Boom. They are connected together and the rails are the same height. There's no bump there. So what we should do now is build a little circuit of Pico track going to a Hornby point and Hornby track going to a Pico point. And I think we should run the Scotsman set loco around it and give it a test. Okay, first of all, uh, let me explain. This is the most perilous TT layout ever created. Uh, so the flexi track is here. I don't want to cut it yet because I might use it on a, to build the layout. So yeah, it made the loop quite big, bigger than the table. So I've had to uh, press my library of absolute classic books into action to prop that up. Uh, 
I suppose at least if it all goes wrong and the train falls on the floor I can make a uh, model train disaster video and get a load of views but hopefully that won't happen um, so as I say we've got Pico flexi track and as you saw me joining the bits together it does join together absolutely fine so we got Pico we got Hornby curve and then it goes to um, all Hornby until here this is the Pico point and obviously back to Hornby all the way around to there and that's where we've got the Hornby, Hornby point so we've got Pico to Hornby point and we've got Pico to P Hornby curve and we've got Hornby to Pico point so that's every possible combination that I could think of let's cross our fingers and give it a run so along the Pico straight onto the Hornby track no problem at all so come around the Hornby track and we're going to go onto the Pico point absolutely fine and across the bridge of doom Hornby track onto the Hornby point connecting to the Pico track smooth as you like so that is everything you wanted to know about uh, Hornby and Pico TT120 track and probably a lot more besides uh, hopefully that's been a nice uh, thorough detailed look at the two types of track hope you enjoyed that I hope you found it uh, useful and uh, yeah thanks very much for watching subscribe for more and I'll see you soon.